good morning, everybody, and thank you for coming out. I see the numbers are increasing as the time goes on. Guys, without further ado, um, I just want to thank you for being here, and I want to thank uh, Dr. Fotoy for allowing me to be a part of this um, and for her coming out and sharing her research um, from her doctoral study, which was looking at the impact of the NYDA, the National Youth Development Agency, um, in the Eastern Cape, um, which is home to all of us. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'll, I would like to introduce Prof. Ronin Wadi, who is the director of the School of Economics, Development and Tourism. And he will, he also happens to be the promoter of Dr. Fotoy, and he will um, do the introductory and opening remarks. And guys, I was so excited about this webinar, I completely forgot to introduce myself. Digamalamnu Sakile Piri. My name is Sakile Piri. I'm with the Department of Development Studies at Nelson Mandela University. And I'm the only thing about being a facilitator is that I wish I was here just to listen and contribute to the discussion. Uh, without further ado, Prof, over to you. Thanks so much, um, uh, uh, Program Director. And uh, greetings, everyone. Um, I'd like to take this opportunity to um, uh, welcome all of you on behalf of the School of Economics, Development and Tourism. We operate within the Faculty of um, Business and Economic Sciences and our Dean, Professor Hendrik Lloyd. A warm welcome to all the viewers, um, all the attendees to this webinar uh, this morning. A special word of welcome to our uh, guests of honor this morning, um, Ms. Uh, Wasim Karim, uh, CEO of NYDA, uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Ganesh uh, Resagam, Lead Private Sector Specialist at World Bank, Dr. Ongama Timka, uh, who is a lecturer and political analyst at Nelson Mandela University. We also would like to give a special welcome to our Head of the Department of Economics, uh, Professor Siden Mishi, and of course, um, our presenter, uh, for today, uh, Dr. Asana Fotoy, we welcome you with a special congratulations to your uh, study, uh, which you've completed uh, successfully. Uh, gratefully, our uh, DVC RII uh, could not be part of these uh, proceedings this morning as she has a bereavement. Um, well, today, to all of us here, it's a special day. It's regarding what we all are passionate about, which is uh, small business development. Um, that small businesses are, are recognized worldwide as a key element in economic and more particularly for industrial uh, uh, development. And most countries in the world uh, have um, using this uh, vehicle or small business development as a mechanism to enhance and facilitate the creation of growth uh, of these small businesses and of course growth of uh, the economy and the growth of employment. For example, the United States um, they've got explosive growth of small businesses uh, through various um, support mechanisms that are provided to those um, small businesses. Even in South Africa, we see a small business development as a pinacchia for uh, solving our problems of unemployment, youth unemployment, and of course, um, economic growth. And um, therefore, the institutions such as the NYDA uh, we of the view that they offer that specialized skill and support to um, our youth so that they don't remain or exit from universities into the pool of unemployed uh, uh, graduates. So the NYDA therefore provides this variety of real and appropriate support to ensure youth entrepreneurs. Having said that, the government also pumps a lot of money and various support uh, institutions, including NYDA, uh, which is an investment. So it's important, therefore, to at some time to look back and do some evaluation to check whether the public expenditure that flows through small business development does yield positive social returns. And the person to talk about that, about that today is uh, our Dr. Asana Fodoy, who will take us through and explain us whether this investment is um, an economically viable investment, which yields positive social and economic returns. With that said, I'd like to hand back over to Mr. Sakile Piri to um, uh, facilitate the, the proceedings. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. 
Thank you, Prof. Um, and I think uh, you gave a fantastic background to the significance of this kind of research and to the work that the NYDA does in terms of not just development, but in terms of um, the national development plan and the development goals of South Africa as a nation. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please uh, allow me to introduce Dr. Fatoy, who will share the findings of her research. Thank you. Good morning, colleagues, and to everyone who's joining us. I'm very excited that this day has finally come and I'll be you know, sharing my results and recommendations based on my PhD study. Um, so I'm gonna quickly share my screen, my presentation. And I'm gonna ask Sakila that you indicate to me once you are able to, to see it on your side. Hi, Doc, we can see your screen. Thank you so much. So as um, shown earlier on, the topic of my PhD research is economic impact assessment of the National Youth Development Agency. In short, we know it as NYDA. Um, and the focus was in the Eastern Cape. And um, thank you also to the introduction given by Professor Nwadi, who was my supervisor for this study. I'm gonna move to, so that I don't lose everyone, I'm gonna move to the introduction slide and then I'm gonna ask Sakile to once more indicate if he can see it. We can see it, thank you. Thank you so much. So as Professor Nwati indicated, I mean, entrepreneurship is seen as a catalyst for our youth to participate in the economy. And this is important because, you know, all of us know that South Africa faces a very high, you know, youth unemployment rate. And in 2019, which was before COVID, it was sitting at 41%. We all, you know, imagine that it has grown since then um, after the economic shock of COVID-19. So, if we go through our youth policies, you will read that they propose interventions towards youth um, developing youth entrepreneurs. And this is because of the low youth entrepreneurship rate um, that we are facing in the country, which was 6.5% in 2019. Also, as mentioned by Professor Nwadi, is that the NYDA has strategies, um, including the grant funding um, towards youth entrepreneurship development. And they offer both financial and non-financial support. In terms of financial support, they offer working capital, stock, and asset finance. In terms of non-financial support, they offer entrepreneurship training and business support services. And if you look um, at their how much they've you know um, given out between the years 2013 and 2019, you'll see that it comes to about a value of 204 million, and this is countrywide. So the objectives of the study um, were to examine the effectiveness, how effective is the grant uh, funding in supporting youth businesses in the Eastern Cape. And to do that, it assess the economic impact, for example, the, you know, which is the social returns, also determine how significant are the um, recipients' gender, education, um, you know, to the success of their businesses, as well also determine the significance of how their um, different industry sectors um, you know, in, to their uh, business performance. Also to determine the impact on job creation and lastly to establish, to establish the challenges faced by the um, recipients of the NYDA grant funding. Um, for those of us who are interested in the theoretical foundations of such a study, and in particular this study, um, you can refer to the framework of um, welfare economics which helps you know, to, um, government to improve social welfare and social returns. It also helps us to judge the achievements of policymakers in allocating resources, and also aids you know, in terms of us doing research on the possible effects of policy interventions. So you can do research before the intervention, then you'll be asking questions like, will this policy increase social welfare? And if you do it, 
you know, after the intervention or after the implementation of a project or a program, then your question will be along, um, you know, did that policy increase social welfare, which was a case, you know, um, in my study, because I, um, the NYDA grant funding was implemented from 2013. So by the time I started with my study, it was, you know, ongoing. Um, so the whole, the question, the last question of did this policy um, increase social welfare is more relevant. And for those of you who are interested um, in this framework, I've put up two references that you can um, refer to. I hope I'm not speaking too fast and losing anyone. Um, if I am, Sakile, you know, <laughs> just shut. And in terms of methodology, so the primary um, hypothesis or the primary methodology of this research is cost benefit analysis, which is used to assess the net benefits of the NYDA grant funding. And then in terms of costs, so the cost side was the actual annual grant amounts disbursed to the youth businesses. And this was received um, directly from NYDA head office. And then in terms of benefits, so you look at the recipient's annual business turnover or sales, um, if you prefer, and this was collected using a questionnaire. And then um, to the secondary hypothesis to determine other factors that influence the recipient's annual business turnover, um, the factors of interest there were gender, education, and industry um, GDP growth rates. And it used, um, for this regression estimation, we used um, cross-sectional data. So the study period um, was six years from 2014, which is a year after the implementation of the NYDA grant funding up to 2000, uh, 2019, which was the year before um, COVID hit. So in terms of data collection, um, so the target population group is the Eastern Cape youth entrepreneurs who benefited from the NYDA grant funding. As I mentioned on the previous slide, a questionnaire was then used to collect information on the demographics of the beneficiaries, their business characteristics, including turnovers and the number of people that they employ, both a permanent and contract um, employees. And also, most importantly, to get you know, their subjective perceptions on the impact of the NYDA support. And lastly, um, the questionnaire was used to collect information on their business challenges. And a focus group was also um, you know, held, um, and this was used to get more detailed opinions and knowledge from selected NYDA grant funding recipients and the participation number there was 14. And all in all, um, there were 253 respondents for the study. So we're gonna get now to the results, which is what we are all here for. Um, so I'm gonna start with the survey results. So in terms of demographics, so the majority of the beneficiaries are male, around 66% and African or black, which is around 83%. And only a few have any form of disability at 1%. And most of the beneficiaries are between 31 and 34 years of age. And many of them have post um, school education or tertiary qualifications around 59%. And in terms of their business characteristics, um, so at the time of the study, 92% of them indicated that they were still active. And also those who were uh, you know, act not active at the time, they indicated you know, COVID and other you know, sorts of reasons that their businesses were not active. Some had gone back to school, some had um, you know, gotten you know, full-time employment somewhere else. So they stopped doing or running their businesses. And um, also um, the majority of the businesses operated in urban areas, about 81%, and 88% of them were registered as private companies. And in terms of where they're operating from, many of them are operating from home. And we all, uh, also asked them you know, to indicate you know, their, um, their sectors or industries, and the popular industries are trades, which includes retail, 
wholesale automotive catering and accommodation, followed by manufacturing um, and personal services at 24%, and lastly, business services at 17%. And their main um, customer base, so local communities or households, which is not a surprise given that most of them are operating from home. And when we asked the age of their businesses, they indicated they indicated that, you know, most of them indicated that they've been operating for three to five years. And, you know, I also asked them, uh, you know, to indicate reasons why they started their business. And, you know, I was happy to hear that, you know, most of them um, started because they recognized an opportunity in the market, which gives us a sense of what the type of entrepreneurs that we are, you know, we are talking about. Um, and most importantly, you know, uh, we ask that they indicate the number of jobs that they've created. As I mentioned, this includes both, you know, contract workers and, you know, full-time workers. And so in 20, in total, you know, all the businesses that responded to the, to the survey, in 2014, they had created job opportunities for 233 employees. And in 2019, this figure had increased to 885 employees. As I mentioned, also very important is their subjective perceptions on the impact of the NYDA support interventions. Um, this was important because we get to hear from the beneficiaries themselves how they, you know, how they view or how they perceive the support that they got from NYDA. It's also important to first note that um, the NYDA grant funding was mostly used for asset finance, you know, so about 78% of the respondents indicated where, you know, what type of, of assistance that they got. And, you know, using a three-point liquid scale measurement, um, we asked, they, they responded that, you know, overall, the NYDA business support services, you know, had a positive impact on their, on their, um, on their business. So there's, a, um, in the questionnaire, about 20 um, NYDA services were listed, and the respondents had to indicate, you know, for each, if there was one, no impact, two, minor impact, and three, uh, major impact. I didn't want to list them all here because it was going to make, you know, my slides big. So if you're interested in, you know, getting an understanding of how they perceive, perceive each of those support services, then you can refer to my thesis. And also, most importantly, we asked whether they've received any, you know, pre or post um, assistance care, and 82%, you know, indicated that they did. And lastly, on the survey results, it's the business challenges. So most highlighted market conditions, which is not a surprise, you know, um, to many of us as the main business challenge, things including, you know, access to bigger markets, competition, price, uh, pricing, diversifying of business activities, sluggish economy, um, barriers to entry and issues with supplier development. However, you know, when you know asked them to indicate you know the solutions because it's one thing to to identify you know a problem and it's another to you know to to see if this person is you know does take time to think of the solutions to their business and it was you know um, I was happy to see that the majority of them were inward looking in terms of the solutions to their business challenges and this speaks to you know my previous slide when I highlighted the type of entrepreneurs we are looking at here like for example their opportunity in entrepreneurs and which links to you know why the majority of them would be inward looking for example looking at what is internal to them or what is part of their um, locus of control to solving um, their challenges. And then in terms of the testing the primary hypothesis using the cost benefit analysis. So for the study, um, due to limitations to data on the cost side, um, we could only cover the years 2016 to 2019. 
And like I mentioned earlier, in terms of costs, the costs you know, came directly from the NYDA um, offices, head office. And then in terms of benefits, um, the, we, that information was collected using the questionnaire and it came directly from the participants or the beneficiaries um, of the NYDA grant funding. So if you just take the costs, the total costs and the total benefits as they are without adjusting them, you get um, net benefits of about 70 million. Um, this is a positive social gain. But you know, I want to focus you guys on number two and number three because these are the decision-making criteria. This, uh, these are the net benefits after you know, the discounting. Um, and in this case, 8% was used as the discounting rate, um, which is the suggested discounting rates. You know, um, if you look at South African literature and you look at suggestions by you know, economists who have done similar work. So the net present value um, after applying the 8% discount rate is 56.9 million. And you, you know, we can safely say that it's a positive social welfare or economic gain. And if you look at the benefit um, cost ratio is 3.6. And as a rule of thumb, you know, um, whenever the, the, the BCR is greater than one, you know, we all agree that it meets the necessary conditions for a project or policy to be supported. Whether it's, you know, um, pre-implementation, and if it's already been implemented in this case, that means we need to continue to support the NYDA grant funding. And when we can, we can also understand this um, as saying for every one rand invested um, in NYDA grant funding or in the youth businesses, we can expect about three rand 60 in return. Also, part of the methodology is to conduct a sensitivity analysis to determine the extent of variations in the net benefits. So for lower bound estimates, a 6% discount rate, so basically uh, minus in two, point, um, two percentage points from the 8% discount rate. And still we see that the net present value is positive as well as the a benefits cost ratio, you know, still remains greater than one. And adding a two point percent, a two um, percentage points to the discount rate of eight percent to get upper bound estimates, you still get a, a positive NPV and a greater than one um, BCR. Now um, for the secondary hypothesis to, to test other factors of influence, how gender, education, and industry, GDP growth rates, how they influence um, the annual business turnovers of the recipients, we see that all three um, variables or factors significantly influence the, the annual business turnovers of, of the participants. As I mentioned, a focus group um, was also conducted. And so the findings are grouped into three categories. So the first category looks at what did the participants say um, with regards to the value that they derived from the NYDA grant funding. So, you know, majority of them indicated that it helped um, them to, you know, kickstart their businesses and that the assets that they had received from NYDA grant funding are still being used in their business operations. And, you know, others also indicated that it, it helped them, you know, the, the, the assistance that they got from NYDA, which includes pre and post K, um, helped them, you know, to have a professional look, which, you know, enabled them to secure or to attract business opportunities. Um, they also, you know, we're very happy that the, the funding came with, you know, other business support services that are non-financial. And the participants also indicated that the application process for the NYDA grant funding is straightforward compared to most um, applications. And they also indicated that without the, uh, uh, the funding from NYDA, the, the business performance would have been slow and also their growth would have been slow. 
And also important to mention that, you know, the, the particip participants indicated that in order for them to grow their businesses, they had to, so for example, after receiving the assets, they didn't fold their arms. You know, they had to actively, you know, seek opportunities in order to grow their businesses. And this takes us back to the type of entrepreneurs that we are actually looking at here. There are always areas of improvement and there are quite a few that were mentioned by, few but very important that were mentioned by the participants. So the first one was access to finance, particularly for those businesses that are at the growth and expansion stages, right? And they also, um, you know, want improvements around turn turnaround times um, so that, you know, applicants, uh, apl people, applicants are not, you know, despondent and, you know, lose hope during that process of, of application. They also highlighted improvements to, uh, with regards to access to markets across industry value chains. They would like to see more collaboration within the entrepreneurship ecosystem. And they would like to see NYDA reduce administrative burden through digitization and integration of the application a process. I'm happy to indicate that you know, NYDA has already implemented the digitization of the application processes. Um, and the C improvements in terms of mentorship and advisory uh, networks. They want to see, they're very happy um, to, you know, to have participated in the study and they want to see more monitoring and evaluation studies. And on, on that point, you know, I'd like to really um, express my gratitude to, to the participants because I was overwhelmed by the, you know, how they received um, the study and how they were willing to share you know, the, the information and, you know, um, the invite was also extended to them. It's just that I can't see the participants now, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure they're in the room with us. And, you know, they would like to see more of these studies being done. They would like to, you know, to have their voices heard through these studies. And um, lastly, in terms of areas of improvement is organizational culture of the agency, to be more service orientated and well as to most importantly, importantly to address suspicions of corruption and patronage in the disbursements of grant funds. And lastly, you know, in the focus group, um, we discussed, you know, the impact of the Eastern Cape economy um, in their businesses, you know, they indicated that yes, indeed, the performance of the of the Eastern Cape economy is vital for you know the success of their businesses. You know, they are also happy to indicate that they also contribute to the economy by creating job opportunities. They would like to see you know improvements in public infrastructure, which impacts on their business operations. They would like to see you know greater development of the Eastern Cape's entrepreneurship um, ecosystem. You know, there's a, they also showed a great desire, you know, to for businesses to be to to organize themselves into forums so that they can create networks, and they would like to hear our leaders be more vocal about the vision um, for business development in in the province. So, based on the the results. Um, first, let me just highlight the main findings. So the main findings is that NYDA is, you know, economically viable. It has yielded um, positive social re um, returns in the period under review. Um, but also, we must note that the recipient's gender education, as well as the performance of the industry, you know, GDP growth rates, significantly influences the success of their businesses. Um, we've also, you know, noted that the the youth businesses created um, job um, job opportunities, and that the main challenge facing youth businesses is around market conditions. So the study concludes that you know in the period under review, um, NYDA in the Eastern Cape delivered on its objectives of improved improved entrepreneurship participation. Um, business skills development and support, as well as improved um, creation of job 
opportunities. So even with these, you know, very exciting um, findings and conclusions, there's still scope um, for improvement. And this is laid out in my recommendations. So the first recommendation, given you know that the 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 grant funding is you know viable, is that this grant funding needs to be you know to be increased. In the in the first slide, I showed that between 2013 and 2019, countrywide, the grant funding has been you know as um, been able to support youth businesses to the value of about 204 million. And in my opinion, that is just too low. So if the, now that we see that this grant funding is working, we need to you know, make it sustainable by increasing the budget. And this will also um, help increase the scale in which in terms of the number of youth uh, businesses who benefit. We definitely need to close gender gaps in youth entrepreneurship. Um, you know, we have the majority as male, uh, we saw in the demographics about 66% are male, and also um, we saw that you know the gender has um, you know has significant impact. And when you go through the the thesis, you will see that you know there is bias towards towards male. So we need to close those gender um, gaps. We need to support. Um, provide more support, uh, business support to, you know, more females. We need to focus, NYD needs to focus on growing the number of female-led um, youth businesses. Also, 1%, we saw in the results, also 1% of, in, 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 of, of um, participants um, having any form of disability. So NYDA has grant funding linked services. Um, they need to develop one that is targeting disabled, um, you know, youth um, in business. We saw um, that education also impacts you, the, you know, the success of of the of the youth uh, businesses, and therefore we need to, you know, promote and advocate um, for the, you know, entrepreneurship um, education across all fields. Especially, you know, as Prof uh, mentioned earlier on, especially tertiary education, uh, youth with tertiary education, because there's a lot of them who are sitting um, with the qualifications and who are not um, who are not employed. Um, the first recommendation is to improve youth business support in rural areas. We saw that the majority of the participants uh, operating in urban areas. So we need to also close this gap. And, you know, NYDA needs to strengthen the uh, um, youth, the support to youth entrepreneurs in the rural areas, as well as consider more rural youth um, as possible grant funding recipients. We need to just diversify economic sectors. Um, looking uh, in particular at agriculture, utilities, um, which is energy, which is water, um, construction and logistics, which is your transportation and storages. And we need, you know, to, to work really hard to invoke interests, you know, in these sectors, because the majority of the youth are operating in the trades. And it's understandable because, you know, those sectors, you know, there's, there's less barriers to entry. But, you know, we need to move towards, you know, um, economies that are known to, you know, to, to be especially, for example, your construction, your agriculture. In fact, all, of, all four of these are known to, you know, to absorb a lot of, of, of labor. So we need to work really hard to support our youth in, the, in, in, in those sectors. Um, number seven, um, also this was, you know, stressed during the, the focus group, improve access to finance for youth business growth, youth businesses who are in growth and expansion stages. Important here, um, NYDA needs to review their current grant funding criteria. There is a call or a cry that, you know, the, the limits are too low. And this excludes, uh, you know, especially when you're looking at growth and expansion stage or, or people who are, operate, who are at growth and expansion stage. So, there's a call for that, and also the, to review the methodology used to calculate the grant um, funding amount ranges. You know, the sentiments are that those ranges are too, 
are too narrow. And there's a call also for funding to be cost of expansion driven rather than pre-established thresholds. So this particular um, recommendation, you know, links to the first recommendation to increase the NYDA grant funding budget. Because if we're looking at supporting youth businesses who are at growth and expansion stage, you would need a greater or a bigger um, budget to be able to do that. Also improvements um, to youth businesses accessing markets. So NYDA will need to strengthen because they have a training program that looks at you know, um, access to markets. They also have um, a program that is linked to the grant funding, which aims to, to improve access to market. So basically in terms of, of training, they need to strengthen the training in innovative marketing sales pitch, as well as public procurement, for example, tendering. And also they need, um, so as part of the discussion with the participants in the focus group, so one question was whether any of the participants were part of the internal procurement or, or, or part of the service providers of NYDA. And at the time, you know, none of them were. So NYDA needs to prioritize qualifying grant funding recipients as part of their own internal procurement process. Reduction of administrative burden. So the digitization of the grant funding application process, as I noted, that is something that's already been implemented by NYDA, I think in the past six months or so. Not, yeah. So the time that my study went for assessment. Um, and also as part of this, I don't know if this is already, you know, you know, part of the, the digitization that NYDA needs to develop an online grant funding tracking system. So this will help, you know, a lot of young people instead of calling um, to follow up on their where they are or the application process or having them, you know, having them to, um, you know, go to the offices, find out where they are. So if there can be an online um, grant funding tracking system, that will help a lot. And also in terms of um, the entrepreneurship development program, in order to improve accessibility, um, the recommendation is that it must, you know, it must make use of online platforms. I mean, we can we can advise there because for the past two or three years, we've been using online platforms to, you know, to deliver our lectures. So there's a call for that. And as much as NYDA has a mentorship program, you know, there's also a call that to ensure that this mentorship program is effective. Firstly, they need to review the approach of the current program and also create a culture of mentorship that actively supports youth businesses. And in terms of the last three recommendations, you know, NYDA needs to, you know, advocate for the provision of infrastructure. Um, firstly, they need to, you know, really work hard on lobbying private and public institutions to provide infrastructure to youth businesses. This can be business premises, mobile vans, and market stalls. And this is these are mentioned particularly because a lot of young people are struggling in terms of, you know, having designated business um, or business premises to operate from, as we saw earlier on, that a lot of them are operating from home. And, you know, there's a call for NYDA to also actively advocate for the driving down of data costs in the, in the country. This has a huge impact on how young people, you know, run their businesses. This also links to, you know, the, the improvements in, in electricity capacity supplied by, by government, that NYDA also needs to be part of that voice that advocates that, you know, government needs to sort this electricity issue out. And then in terms of the COVID-19 relief support for youth businesses, so the 2020, um, you know, support that was given, it was short-lived. Even the, the, the application period was very short. A lot of people did not, you know, um, benefit from that. And, you know, there is a case that, you know, 
um, we need to advocate that the, the COVID-19 relief support system for youth business be extended, you know, for the next three years. Because, you know, some, some um, this actually just reminded me that for those um, participants that indicated that they were no longer active, you know, um, COVID was one of the was one of the reasons. So we saw, um, even outside of you know youth business, we saw the impact of COVID nineteen. So you can't have a case where we just have a once off support um, system, and that's it. And lastly, in terms of you know practices in you know in so NYDA needs to improve their practices in youth business support services. They need to adopt a service oriented approach rather than a helping hand approach. And also, if you um, when you look at my chapter four, there's a list of outlined international standards practices. So you know, one of my what the last recommendation is that NYDA needs to review their current practices against those international standards in order to improve, you know, their organizational culture. And lastly, um, in terms of delimitations of the study, so the study only focused on those who received the NYDA grant funding, an um, exclusion of those who never received the grant funding. And it only covered, you know, one province out of nine. We know that NYDA, you know, has branches, you know, throughout um, the country. And for you know people who want to take you know such studies um, further, there are also recommendations there for a longitudinal study. This will help us detect consistency in the findings, right? Um, also, to detect counterfactual effects, we need to apply more experimental approaches. And this is very important. You know, I I, I battled a lot with this. Um, so NYDA, you know, we, to help us, you know, with future standards st studies, um, we recommend that you publish the audited grant funding disbursements by province. Because currently, you, you do it, you know, um, as you know, aggregated for the whole country. So if you can, do, you know, disaggregate it by province or by branch, it will help, um, you know, with future studies, and also not to, you know, contravene the Poppy Act. So as soon as, you know, a, a recipient or a, or a young person receives the, the, the grant funding when they're signing their contract, can they also indicate, um, you know, consent, you know, as part of their, of their contract, um, specifically for research purposes? Can be, yeah, for research, let me not just, yeah, for research purposes, whether you're in academic or not. So that will also help, you know, with future studies. And Ngozi Ndiabulela, this is the end of my presentation. So um, the last slide just presents uh, my contact details. So you can email me on my work email or my, G, my Gmail email or both um, if you need to, you know, if you have any further queries or any interesting comments that you'd like to share with me. Over to you, Sakila. I'm just going to try to stop sharing and also just stop my video. Thank you, Dr. Fatoy. That was fantastic. Um, I'm going to, you know, resist the urge to ask you questions and uh, <laughs> engage on some some issues that I was thinking about while you presented. But it was very insightful and very engaging presentation. Thank you again. And we have the honor and the pleasure of having respondents to um, the study that was presented, or rather, the findings of the study that were presented. And one of those respondents is Mr. Wasim Karim, who is the Chief Executive Officer of the NYDA. And if you had the, um, if you were here at the start of the talk, we had a, a running loop of the different respondents and 
they are uh, bios. Um, we have very accomplished respondents. So, you know, if I was to sit here and read their CVs, we'll be here till the end of time. But amongst uh, his many uh, achievements, uh, Mr. Kareem is, uh, he sits on multiple independent audit committees, uh, such as Brand SA, and this is because by profession, he is an accountant. Uh, also, Mr. Kareem is, and I think most importantly, is very passionate about youth entrepreneurship and you know, kind of the opportunities and uh, we can create for, for, for the youth. Um, without further ado, uh, Mr. Kareem, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Sakile. Thanks very much for the opportunity. Um, and, and thank you for also the opportunity to be a respondent to Dr. Potoy's study. So in the, in the introductory remarks, uh, the program director, I think, referred to me as the, the guest of honor. I thought I should make it clear that there's only one guest of honor here today, um, and, and that should be Dr. Putoy. Uh, I think the journey to embark on pursuing a PhD, which is the peak of academic excellence, is not an easy one. Uh, one must go through multiple challenges to be able to do it, including sacrificing time with family and friends and work, and really having to put a multitude of efforts into achieving that goal. Um, I think it would be wrong of me not to start off this introduction by expressing a huge amount of congratulations to Dr. Potoy on this amazing achievement. You know? um, and really as a, as a secondary aspect, just say thank you to her for, for choosing the NYD as a partner in conducting that research. I think really her achievement is an embodiment of what we speak about when we say we believe in the democratic project that is South Africa. Um, so, so I thought to start off with that as an introduction. Um, in terms of responding to the study itself, I'll give um, some context to the discussion. So I think a lot of colleagues in the room would be familiar with the National Youth Development Agency and our work. Our work scope is beyond just youth entrepreneurship. We're very much focused on broader coordination of the youth development work in South Africa. Of course, the burning issue is always youth unemployment. Um, and in that aspect, we work across entrepreneurship, employment, and youth service opportunities as well. The NYD was formed as a merger of two institutions, the Nkubumpu Youth Fund, which was mainly a development finance institution, um, and the National Youth Commission, which was a lobby and advocacy institution. And Around about 2014, the decision was taken to move us away from loan-based finance, both micro and SME loans, towards uh, grant-based finance, right? And this was informed by a number of research studies which would have suggested that the uptake for entrepreneurship in South Africa, amongst young people in particular, still remained relatively small, um, given economies of similar size and scale as South Africa. And, and, and maybe let's start there to say that if one is to look at the South African economy, right, we know the number one challenge that we battle is, is unemployment and very high rates of youth unemployment, right? Um, but we still continue to be indicated as a uh, middle income country, right? So for middle income country, we have very high rates of unemployment, We're very to the right hand side of the graph when it comes to unemployment, right? But if we look at our participation in really small micro enterprises, yeah, relative to other countries of our size, we have very small participations in those levels. And what we find is when we talk about the economic miracle that would have happened across Asia, we see that really micro and small enterprises was the driver of that kind of growth. Yeah. So, that strategic decision was informed based on research on the ability to understand the context that many of these young people come from vulnerable and marginalized backgrounds and that we needed to offer a structured service to young people um, with a move away from loan-based finance towards grant-based finance. But very much seeing our niche in the market as young people who were starting out in life, young people who would be embarking on their first, second, or third business um, who would not be ordinarily be able to find support elsewhere in the economy um, and really having a bias towards township and rural based enterprise. Yeah. Um, grant funding is not offered in isolation. It is packaged together with 
access to skills, which we see as critical. If I speak about the skills that we really see come through, the two skills on the, on the technical side, we see that where young people have some level of financial skill, where they would have done better at math and accounting at school, this generally points to positive correlation in terms of success in business. And the softer skill that we see that, that translates through entrepreneurs that succeed, uh, the word the president used in the state of the nation, um, become quite contentious, but it's that word called resilience, yeah. ability to try to fight through difficult times, to endure through difficult times, to be able to ultimately succeed as an entrepreneur. Of course, access to finance is a big piece of the puzzle, and we know there's a huge funding gap in South Africa. And the last one, potentially being the most important, is access to actual market opportunities. Yeah? And uh, a big part of our offering is both in terms of pre-disbursement as well as post-disbursement support to young people to ensure that each entrepreneur that enters the NYD is treated as an individual whose growth and whose trajectory lies within the organization, that they can be part of their development and their journey um, in, their, in their attempt to grow and scale their businesses. Yeah? I think much of the findings that come out of the report are very much consistent with what we see in our own monitoring and evaluation. We've conducted five evaluations of the NYD's entrepreneurship programs. And over time, that has assisted us in, in growing and responding to the recommendations. Um, and I think very much what comes out of this report is consistent with some very interesting new findings as well. Ultimately, from the perspective where we sit, we have seen the program succeeding in being able to harness the potential of young entrepreneurs right? um, and develop that potential and take them to the, to the next level. For example, when we did our first evaluation, um, I think that was back in around 2015, we would have seen about 48% of businesses succeed or, or continue into operation post two years post disbursement. When we look at our figures now, we see around about an 80% figure of young youth owned enterprises which are surviving beyond the two year period. Um, so certainly we do see value one of the key recommendations was obviously growing the size of the program. And I think that is one thing that we have been focused on uh, quite, quite uh, strategically. Um, the program started off, if I remember correctly, I've been around too long now, uh, started off with about 20 million rand in funding in 2014. We've been able over a number of years to grow that now into a 100 million rand fund for young people. It is still the way close to near enough what it should be. Um, and I think we, we've brought in more a number of partners. So you've seen similar, in some cases, people have invested in the NYJ. So for example, the Unemployment Insurance Fund has supported us and will be making a structured three-year contribution towards our grant fund. Um, the Limpopo Provincial Government has done similarly. But what you've also started seeing happening is that provinces have established their own funds very much based on the modalities of what the NYDA had put together. So in KwaZulu-Natal, a youth fund was established. In Malanga, a youth fund was established. In the Eastern Cape itself, the Isikalo Youth Fund was established. And those use similar modalities to the NYDA so that we grow the amount of funding that is available and ring fenced for young people. Yeah. I think in terms of the recommendations, we certainly see um, many of them as being key, and I think we've noted all of them coming out of the study. The one of customer service is particularly close to my heart. Um, you know, I, I really, we really try to encourage our employees at NYDA to not see this as a typical government agency. You know, people should not have the experience they have when they go to a home affairs office. It should really be an, an organization which is inclusive of young people. And you know, when you speak to young people in South Africa, you find that beyond beyond the issue of unemployment, which is a burning issue, youth feel excluded. They don't feel part of the decision-making process. And the interaction with organizations like the NYD is critical in that inclusion process. If we want them to be part of this process of building a better South Africa for all. Yeah? I think then in terms of my, my final sort of closing comments around around the study is to say, 
I do think we need some sort of a paradigm shift in South Africa when it comes to small businesses, right? We all seem to like businesses that are tech and businesses that are glossy and businesses that are fancy. But I want to make the argument that real businesses, the ones that exist in South Africa and are the backbone of job creation in this country are the ones that exist in the not so fancy spaces, the ones that exist in taxi ranks and the tuck shops and schools. Um, and those are the businesses that have the ability to create the majority of the amount of jobs and support the most marginalized environment in our society. And I want to dispel the myth that there are not enough of those businesses. I think they are, but I don't think we're giving them the enough support they need to be able to grow and sustain themselves. The answer to solving our unemployment crisis doesn't involve giving lots of money at the top and hoping it will trickle down. And I'm, I'm glad my friends from the World Bank are here because I'm told they don't believe in trickle down economics anymore. It really lies in the fact that we need to put more funds and more resources at the most bottom level of society. And then we'll really see the trickle up impact of economics working in our society, working for the most mar marginalized and the most vulnerable. Thank you very much, Program Director. I'll pause my response there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kwame. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Kareem, and thank you for highlighting that the special guest is Dr. Fotoy. Um, and without further ado, I think we'll move on to the next respondent. Um, I think I saw his name in the chat, and that's uh, Mr. Ganesh Rasagam. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Uh, Mr. Rasagam, as the previous respondent highlighted, is um, representative of the World Bank. He's in fact the lead uh, private sector specialist um, based in Pretoria, but he was previously based at the World Bank headquarters in Washington, DC. Um, I think his core expertise are in innovation, entrepreneurship, competitiveness, and creating an enabling environment. I think quite interestingly, when I was going through his, bi his bio, uh, Mr. Rasagam has a background in engineering. So uh, I think it's quite interesting uh, what he learned there that's in terms of his skills that are transferable into the development space. Uh, but without further ado, please go ahead, sir. Thank, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Program Director Sakile. And, uh, you know, um, so um, I also agree with what my friend was saying that the, the real celebrity today is Dr. Sanda Fotoi. So let me start by congratulating her on, on, on this uh, really exciting piece of research uh, and you know there's some very very interesting findings coming out of the, the research uh, which I think uh, uh, you know I can speak to some of that uh, shortly but I also want to congratulate Wasim and the NYDA for this partnership between the NYDA and the university uh, for this research I think it'll be great to see more of this collaboration between uh, academia in South Africa and the government agencies uh, that are in this space. Uh, and so congratulations to, to NYDA as well for this partnership with, with the Mandela University. Um, I was trying to sort of organize my, my thoughts uh, when I was listening to the presentation. And I thought what might be useful is to, to look at perhaps some, so I would like to share some of my thoughts on the methodological questions around, around evaluating grant programs. And, and as, as you may know, uh, in the World Bank, we do uh, have carried out several evaluations of grant funded programs to support entrepreneurs. So, so I thought I can share some of my thoughts around that, um, especially in the context of grant funding for for entrepreneurs uh, and and some some you know some some sharing of findings. And also I wanted to share with you the work that we are currently doing in South Africa with our partners in the Department of Small Business Development and the Department of Science and Innovation around uh, uh, on support for entrepreneurship programs uh, and, and the evaluation of, of programs. Uh, so, so firstly, um, I was, when I was listening to Dr. Potoyi's presentation, and, and she, she was very clear in the way she laid out the methodology and, and uh, uh, the approach. So um, I think one, one useful way of looking at it is the theory of change uh, for these grant programs. And if I, when I read her, 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 her report, the thesis, 
she had actually looked at several grant programs from the NYDA. So the different types of programs, if I understood it correctly. Uh, so I think setting out a theory of change uh, 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 as we normally do in this kind of evaluations would be interesting to see. Um, so what, what are the interventions? Uh, there was a reference to pre uh, and post care support, non-financial support, and then actual grant support. And so what were the outputs of each one of these different types of, of, of support, the pre-support, the grant funding, and the post-support? What were the intermediate uh, outcomes? I think she alluded to the fact that some of the grants went to purchase of assets. Uh, they created, uh, so there were new uh, assets acquired by these businesses from the grants. Perhaps they introduced new management procedures, IT systems for their businesses. And of course, of course they hired people using the grant funding. So this intermediate outcomes, I think, uh, were, were measured. And then what are the longer term sort of outcomes from the grant funding? This would be, uh, did the firms, the survival, survival of these businesses, uh, did all of them survive? Did some of them actually close down because of challenges? And those who survive, how much did they grow in terms of their revenue and employment? And, and were there productivity gains from, from these businesses? So I think that that kind of theory of change uh, would, would require more granular data, uh, which is always a challenge uh, when we do this sort of evaluations across the world. Uh, but then uh, we can sort of track uh, the different, um, at the application stage, for example, and I think you know, she, she, she mentioned that in her findings. So at the application stage itself, uh, what are the types of, of, of applicants by, by gender, by educational background, which she has referenced, and so on. And then at the selection stage itself, how do you select this, this, uh, this grant beneficiaries, and then the implementation and the outcome. So I think that that kind of theory of change uh, approach is, is useful to frame uh, this, this conversations around uh, evaluation of, of programs. And then there are different types of evaluations. And I think uh, what the, the economic impact assessment that she carried out is more of a process evaluation where uh, you are assessing if the objectives of the grants were achieved and, and you identified implementation challenges in, in, in the way the grants were managed from the uh, feedback from the beneficiaries. Uh, so this is useful to look at what corrective measures are needed uh, for future grant programs. And then you can compare the expected outcomes to the actual data that, that you gather from the beneficiaries. Um, was there a gap in terms of what was expected and what was actual uh, results? Uh, the focus is more on outputs and, and processes, uh, and this evaluation will not sort of look at attribution of, uh, of, 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 for the outcomes from these from this grants. And, and you could potentially include an efficiency analysis as well, you know, in future work. I think which you had also mentioned, uh, Dr. Fotoi, in your, your uh, last slide. And then we can look at um, instead sort of process evaluation and impact evaluation approach, where we actually assess the effects and impacts of the support program, in this case, the grant programs, and the mechanisms that were more impactful in terms of delivery of the grants. So this would require a more rigorous uh, uh, sort of uh, database uh, or evidence of the effects. And this could lead to, of course, recommendations for policy uh, uh, decisions. Uh, so here, what you can do is to have a control group of people who did not benefit from the grant. And then you compare the outcome be between the beneficiaries of the grants and those who did not get the grants. And, and then you can tell the story of the attribution of, of the program. You know, So did those who received the grants do significantly better than those that not receive the grants, and then you can control for other other uh, other factors, and and this would would lead to some sort of an effectiveness uh, uh, analysis. Now, why am I why am I sharing all this? Because I think the work that you, you have done, Dr. Fatou, is so important uh, that there's a, a wealth of, of information, uh, and and we need to be able to now sort of expand that that work to to include. Um, other agencies uh, who are active in South Africa in this space. And uh, also NYDA itself, I, I'm, I'm sure has a wealth of data, which we can uh, you know, dig deeper into and, and, and see how we can get uh, findings. One question I had was, um, and, and perhaps you may have the answer to this, 
how different is, is Eastern Cape from Western Cape or Hoteng in terms of the entrepreneurship ecosystem itself. And I think Wasim alluded to the fact that you need uh, grants are uh, one instrument amongst a range of instruments that entrepreneurs uh, uh, would, would, would require. Uh, and, and so to be able to understand the ecosystem in Eastern Cape compared to Western Cape or Hoteng and tell a story of what's different and why the kind of support entrepreneurs in Eastern Cape would need would be different from that provided to other parts of South Africa would be an interesting, um, uh, interesting story. Now, I want to talk about grants in general and, and from our experience uh, of grant programs around the world, um, we find that A, everybody loves grants programs. You know, governments love grants as a way of, you know, saying that we support entrepreneurs and businesses. The beneficiaries, of course, love grant programs. Who doesn't want free money? But then the question is, what, what's the market failure that the grant is, is fixing? I think that's an important question to ask. I know Wasim talked about the shift away from, uh, uh, for, for the NYD itself, the policy shift from loan-based support to grant-based support, um, uh, loan-based finance to grant-based finance. And I'm, I'm sure there were good reasons for that. But the broader question is, and I think someone mentioned in the chat, um, is the grant addressing a specific market failure, uh, which in this case would be access to commercial finance uh, for youth entrepreneurs. Uh, so what is the problem there? And I, I don't know whether there are any bankers in the room today, but I would ask the banks, why are the banks not lending to young entrepreneurs uh, who have credible business models, who have a credible uh, uh, business proposal? Uh, is it a question of risk? And then in that case, should government funding go towards de-risking mechanisms? To allow banks to lend to these entrepreneurs. And there are very innovative digital finance financing instruments now in the market globally, and, and that can be deployed. So that is, is a larger question of what's the objective of the grant, what's the market failure, and then is the grant fixing that market failure for the entrepreneur and handing them over to a, a, a commercial financing, uh, uh, or handing them over to commercial financing opportunities, which would then be more sustainable and pro provide hand-holding to the entrepreneur as he or she grows a business. Because the needs of the financing needs would be different for different stages of the, of the enterprise. So that's, that's a, a, a policy question that I think we're all grappling with. And I think it would be useful to kind of have a discussion around that in terms of the NYDA's policies. Uh, the second is the differentiation amongst entrepreneurs. You know, a woman entrepreneur and, and, a, and a male entrepreneur could have very different financing needs. Uh, and, and that's based on evidence from all parts of the world. So a more differentiated, more targeted approach to uh, the types of entrepreneurs. You can have entrepreneurs, subsistence level entrepreneurs who are setting up a mom and pop shop whose needs are very different from entrepreneur in a tech business who's trying to grow a tech business into a, a, a commercially viable uh, a business. So that understanding of the different needs of entrepreneurs the different stages of the business, and then how the grants, NYDA cannot solve the problems of all, cannot solve all the problems of the entrepreneurs. There are various actors in the, in the ecosystem. So perhaps we can think of a way of NYDA grants coming in at, uh, to, to serve a particular market uh, failure. And then that entrepreneur is handed over to another government support program, perhaps a DSBD, CEDA or CIFA, uh, who will then provide you know, a different type of support that is needed. So the kind of uh, uh, seamless support that an entrepreneur needs from the beginning of their journey and as they grow their businesses, I think that it's useful to look at the spectrum of, of instruments that are available in the, in the space and what uh, uh, fits in, uh, in in that space. I think that that's... Uh, a conversation to have, uh, and I know that we've been talking, uh, Wasim, and I fully take your point that it's not all about tech startups and you have to keep the economy.
Uh, hi, Mr. Osagam. I think you are breaking up uh, just towards the end there. Okay, I think we've lost him. Right, okay. I think you may have lost me there for 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 uh, yes yes yeah, yes back. sorry it was okay cool. if you yeah, we, I think we lost about the last that, yeah, I think it was internet okay I'm, I'm gonna wrap up before the internet uh, gets me no I wanted I was going to say that that uh, the reality is that the fiscal the fiscal space for government of South Africa to provide the economic challenges so. The, the way grants are, are deployed and, and the impact um, and the measurement, it's a very, very useful exercise. I want to congratulate, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, Dr. In, 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 Dr. in particular and, and NYDA for doing this. Now, last few thoughts. We have, we are working. Hi, Mr. Rosagam, we've lost you again. Sorry, there was another blip, and I'm going to really wrap up now before I get... Sorry, Mr. Rosagam, could I just yeah. uh, um, recommend that maybe you turn off your video because I think it's a bandwidth issue. So okay, let me, let, me, let, me yeah. let me do that. Let me do that. I'm so sorry about this. Uh, no, 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 no. Uh, so let me just wrap up my 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 my, my comments with this. Uh, that, so the work we're doing with the uh, with the DSBD and the DSI, uh, the two two things I wanted to talk about. One is this this review of programs that we carried out, and and the findings are very similar to what uh, we heard today. Uh, that there's just a lack of granular data. The way the data is captured up by the programs and and collated and reported. There's a lot of work to be done in that space so that you have good data to measure the impact of these programs. And we are helping the DSBD do that. And, and finally, we are working with the DSBD and the DSI to support the Innovation Bridge Portal, which is a platform to connect entrepreneurs to each other, to connect entrepreneurs to the ecosystem actors. And there are several programs underway to support entrepreneurs uh, through this Innovation Bridge Portal. But that's for, for another uh, conversation. And I really look forward to engaging with Dr. Potoi uh, after this 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 seminar, I think that uh, you'll be very interested in some of the things that I, I mentioned. Thanks again for for inviting me to this session, and uh, congratulations. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for that. I that was a really good response. Um, I thought the nuance was was very good, and I think to any prospective. Uh, doctoral students in the in the webinar, there were a lot of uh, areas where additional research is required that were highlighted and, you know, potential knowledge gaps. Um, but there was a lot of uh, affirmation of, you know, what we're finding, both from Dr. Fotoy's research, um, from what Mr. Kareem spoke about earlier, and for um, what um, Mr. Rasagam has just spoken about. Um, Without further ado, colleagues, I'd like to uh, introduce the next uh, speaker, which is Dr. Ongamam Timka, who's a lecturer and in a and political analyst analyst um, at Nelson Mandela University. Um, I've had the pleasure of working with Ongama before, and much like Dr. Fotoy, um, he's what I would call a, you know a public academic, someone who doesn't just sit in the ivory tower, but actually you know engages with uh, the local community on key issues and. You know, if you're like me and you listen to Mklo and Nene or Metro on your way to work, then you've probably heard him being interviewed uh, a couple of times. Um, I'd also like to congratulate him because he also recently got his doctorate. And so special congratulations to you. Uh, without further ado, Ongama, please go ahead. Uh, you're still on mute. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning, colleagues. Uh, if you can stop sharing so I can share my screen. Uh, good, 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 good morning. It's such an honor to be here. I'd like to echo Osim's uh, comments as well, that indeed 
the guest of honor today is uh, Dr. Asanda Fotoi. Um, I'll tell you now, I don't want to spoil my presentation. What excited me about uh, her work? Um, sure. Um, so I think it's also best for me to keep my video off. Um, or in fact, maybe if it starts giving problems, I'll keep it off. I'm I'm joining you from the Drakensberg uh, uh, mountains. Um, yeah, I'd like to. I, I'm honored, greatly honored to be able to contribute to this session. And my very curious self, or what we would call in this class, Okobava. So I was sitting at graduation and watching uh, the economics department showing off really at the graduation with lots of PhDs doing very exciting work. And I thought I wouldn't keep quiet after seeing, after reading uh, Asanda's uh, citation. And I reached out to her in an email and uh, that earned me a spot here today. Um, the What I'd like to focus on in uh, my presentation are just four things. Uh, personal journey, interest in the study, uh, the political economy of development, and the lonely journeys that academics fight in that, sorry, uh, practitioners fight in that space, and the so what. Um, the personal journey, uh, I think uh, 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 Mr. Piri, you mentioned, Ma, I'm very much involved um, beyond the academic space in directly working to try and see how we can enable, you know, a greater developmental outcomes in the country. So um, I lost my virginity in development activism in 2006, when as a politics and journalism graduate, um, uh, I, want, I, I worked in that uh, organization. And soon what I witnessed was that what I was uh, involved in was an exercise in creative politicking in post-apartheid South Africa. I observed how executives and their allies outside the organization were engaging with a very hostile or let me say contested political economic space in order to leverage funds for the Kuha project. Um, the Kuha project could not have succeeded had it attracted um, ordinary executives who were just about, this is my job and I'm getting paid at a certain day of the month because there was hardly any guaranteed payment at the, at the beginning stages of that project. Um, the politics of getting the port to be approved um, for development, the po politics of getting the IDZ to be developed uh, are very fascinating. I documented it in a study called Creative Politicking in Post-Apartheid South Africa. But uh, let me say what got me excited um, most about the study was that I, I have got a personal experience with the NYDA. Um, one in 2011, um, sorry, in 2010, that's what I missed from the study. I, I submitted an application, I think at the time it was still loan funding, uh, for a call center venture with an Indian, uh, uh, on a sub subcontract in India. Uh, and it took long for the NYDA to, 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 to respond to me. Uh, then I went to the ECDC, they said something about uh, when I had started the business, told me about technical insolvency. Uh, and, and then the, the, the that business lasted three months, by the way. I was happy that I couldn't get funding and I had wanted to resign from my job. I was saved by my mentor, was my pastor at the time, who said to me, I see the millions in the spreadsheet, go and uh, invoice three months and then come back, let's talk resignation. And that is the council that saved me. So in 2011, in the recovery of that uh, business failure, I reoriented the business to start uh, focusing on my core competences, which was communications. So I applied for a branding and website grant at NYDA and got 
an excellent logo, which I still use to this day, wonderful website, wonderful marketing material, which gave me a, a, an, a, 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 an urge in terms of you know, being able to network and present uh, myself professionally in, in, in spaces. Then 2019, uh, oh, 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 I see, I, I, I've got this, so it's up and it's, it's zigzagging. In 2016, I became a business plan consultant to the NYDA after successfully tendering on a very cumbersome national bid process. I saw Aluani here. We were the, in in that first, you know, cohort. I think uh, Dr. Ricardo Damis as well, whom I saw in the call. So, so, so the story of becoming a business plan consultant. I mean, my my skills is politics. Then worked in general management at Kucha. Um, comes not unrelated to the failure in 2011, in 2010, to secure funding from the NYDA. Because in that process of writing a business plan, at least I learned a skill, which I then turned around and supported other entrepreneurs in the space. And uh, Wasim, you are quite correct, by the way, there were a range of other uh, players within the small business development space, ECDC, um, Eastern Cape Development Corporation, CEDA, Small Enterprise Finance Agency, and the works. Um, so, so, so I provided that, I rendered business planning uh, uh, skills in that space, three years with the NYDA. And for me, this three years was important because I was helping entrepreneurs to be able to access the grant. Uh, if not the grant, to be able to apply for funding uh, the, for, from uh, CIFA and the IDC. And why this is important, uh, colleagues, is that people under, uh, underestimate the effect to an entrepreneur of not being able to write um, and, and, and actually present a wonderful idea to elitist institutions who are run by people who moved straight from accounting school uh, to the, 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 the development funding agency and do not have the experience of the, the, how it is to build something from an idea to being a real business. And then undermine people who are doing it through jargon and language, which is very elitist and exclusionary. So I became an activist for to the extent that I would support uh, the funded people, um, uh, uh, even when they need support meeting with the financier. I remember one person buying into an agricultural venture, uh, excellent business plan they, that was, uh, you know, the, the agricultural economist within the bank, uh, he was saying that, uh, and they needed the, the additional reinforcement in terms of somebody that could help them, uh, you know, talk to the merits of the business. 2019, I was excited. Uh, I exited the NYDA program. And then uh, 2021, um, I was a defender of the NYDA on social media because there's been this, uh, and it's right, by the way, uh, it, it, there was a, a, where people are attacking the NYDA for its close affinity with the ANC Youth League. And indeed, um, they are quite correct that there has tended to be, uh, in the history of the Umsobom Youth Fund, for example, and the NYDA, uh, where youth leaders, youth leaguers, uh, use it as a pathway to, uh, you know, advancing uh, themselves. But, and in fact, I was almost tempted in 2016 to theorize that the less, the weaker the youth league, the stronger the NYDA became. Uh, Wasim is here to respond to that. But I felt that the organization at that time when the NYDA, when the youth league was relatively weaker, was uh, was functioning effectively. Uh, in fact, maybe Wasim wouldn't want to respond to that because he wants he's going to get himself in trouble. Uh, then, 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 then. In so I I I had a few politicians tweeting on social media that we need to get rid of the NYDA because the NYDA is a a vehicle of the ANC Youth League for self-aggrandizement. And I was saying, this is wrong. And, and that started, by the way, even last month. It is wrong because 
these people who are saying this relate with South Africa's political economy from a macro perspective and from aggregated reports about things. And sometimes these are fabricated in order to drive an agenda. So I was sitting at graduation in 2022 and saw uh, the story of uh, um, the, the research that Dr. Asanda Fotoy has done. And I was excited about it that finally he has applied their mind instead of this thing we do in South Africa where, where there's po possible uh, 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 poor data, but a lot of emotion. And this emotion has resulted in institutions being killed uh, out of political ideas, not based on uh, some uh, uh, studies. So, so, so my interest in the study was precisely the cost, uh, uh, cost benefit uh, 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 analysis that she's done, because this is a major political economic issue in South Africa. If you are in the development space, from uh, special economic zones to municipal um, uh, projects to a uh, recent experience of mine in development trusts, it is lonely to fight battles about uh, justifying investment in communities where the return on investment cannot be expressed in an income statement and the balance sheet immediately. Um, and where you find people who have got an elitist attitude to what's needed in South Africa with very much with strong power, uh, making decisions about uh, things that affect ordinary people when they don't have the data, but all that they have is uh, their ideas about what can potentially work hypothetically. So and so 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 the contested nature of development or development work in our country and our argumentative democracy necessitates what you are suggesting, um, Asanda, and I think the two speakers before me, uh, that we need more work of this nature to be done in order for our discussions to be a lot more data driven than they are uh, about impressions. I've mentioned how lonely uh, the development battles are and us who are involved both in academia and in the trenches feel it every day. And it's 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 a thankless role in South Africa where one, you are butting heads with elites and, and, and on other levels, you've got to manage communities who have been a, a, a nurtured in an environment that told them they couldn't do uh, what, uh, you know, they couldn't be excellent. They couldn't do some of the things that uh, we try and, and, and encourage them to do. Um, broadly, and this is my last slide, by the way, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the political economy and the so what, the reality of the matter is that in South Africa, and across the developing world, we are contending with varieties of capture. If you've read the work of John Perkins um, and 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 I heard you Sakila earlier. Uh, oh no, no, it was Wasim uh, referring to the changing role of the World Bank, which is appreciated. Uh, but we've had the countries in the in the global south being coerced into programs that benefit global financial capital more than they do um, the, co the, the, the interests of their countries. So, so I talk in a piece about systemic versus predatory capture. The reality in South Africa is that at any given time, if we are discussing development, we are navigating this tension between uh, these varieties of capture that we have. And therefore, we're not able, Asanda, uh, much as we produce good research uh, that can help advance our country, we are uh, confronting you know, uh, 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 power structures that are resistant to the self-determination uh, or, or cost for, 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 for us to determine the course uh, of our development as, as we see fit and as we see best fitting the environment that we found us, we find ourselves in. So I, I, I have completed myself a study in the construction sector. And I make the point that these laser-focused studies that look at phenomena at a microeconomic uh, or sector-specific levels or, or give us a picture of the subnational. Um, are important. So don't worry that your study doesn't actually paint a broader picture. Yes, they, it's important to understand the system and 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 country data, but subnational levels are important because 
And we, we in the Eastern Cape, the Eastern Cape is seen as the most poor of the among some of the most two, two of the in the two two most poor uh, provinces in the country and to understand dynamics of uh, how the impact of investment in this area is important because we have areas where uh, for example in the agricultural space there has been a lot of successes and a lot of failures to the extent that people would be discouraged from playing with grant funding in this space because of the failure rate. In fact, some of the lonely battles, I keep mentioning these words, that we are fighting are with people who control monies that should be spent in this region, but are anxious about the likelihood to succeed. Uh, there are reports that come from here that say things don't work. We've had recently, for example, in the area of uh, um, Bedford and those close to those areas where wind farm funds are said to have gone down the drain in projects that were wasteful. Uh, so there are a lot of these reports that come and still show one story. It's important for us to actually understand the exact nature of things from the bottom. The, when we understand it, it helps us to understand the exact ways in which exclusion happens and be able to identify pathways to uh, inclusion. And, and, and for us to be able to do this, we need a little bit of uh, epistemic humility. The understanding that we will not know, for example, everything and it's important to go right at the bottom and understand what works with a view to be to 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 to, to making changes. Um, and then once we understand it and make the recommendations, we need bold and transformative leadership to do the right thing. We 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 do not have want in this country of what is the right thing to do, but our leadership is a little bit timid and not bold enough to take these things that may not be the reality of the rest of the world, but we've been able to determine them at a local level. And we just need bold and transformative leadership to implement them. Um, I don't want to be belabor the point about further research, but what you've done here, uh, we, we be, we're busy with the strat process in the politics department, history and politics department. And Prof. Namalangam Kiza says, in South Africa, we have failed to produce a distinctly post-colonial uh, 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 academy. Unlike Ghana and Nigeria and other um, early path pathfinders, uh, you know, who, who did distinctly, did distinctly post-independence ac uh, academy or university uh, uh, outputs. So there's a call, and I think that this is responding to it, where we begin to theorize from the bottom up. We begin to write things and tell the story of our lived reality, rather than regurgitating uh, narratives from the global north um, and, and not be able to actually set an agenda for scholarship and, and practice um, in our parts of the world. And then last one, I thought I, could, I wouldn't resist the temptation to engage with your topic uh, uh, um, uh, sir, from the World Bank. Sorry, I, I, I didn't, um, I, I don't want to butcher your name. Well, the market failure is simply this: you 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 partly write about the uh, the the access issue, access to finance, but also we have found that banks, and this is practical experience as opposed to uh, research, banks and our elitist uh, development finance institutions in this country have got a very uh, uh, inaccessible approach to funding. Uh, business. So I was excited when I saw that the NYDA has got money, and I hope they have retained this, to even enable uh, inf inf informal businesses that are not registered up to a threshold of 10,000 rand. I wouldn't change the threshold, and I wouldn't change the policy position that seeks to enable that. Uh, it should be done, and 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 the market failure is the fact that there's no appetite to to in to in be involved in that kind of risky startup uh, finance area. And grants are precisely the right thing for the NYDA to do because one, the people that 
go and apply for their loans don't have collateral. The history of Black people in this country is that they didn't own property until a bonded property or valued property until the 1980s. So many of them haven't inherited property which they can use or leverage as collateral for loans. So these grants are, are correct. They must be increased um, and, 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 and be accessible to a wide range of people. The thing that should be guarded against is the tendency of politicians to want to come and direct uh, 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 at a transaction level rather than at a policy level how 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 these institutions should be investing uh, thanks a lot greatly appreciate the opportunity um, thanks a lot asanda uh, for doing this work and i think as it is said more needs to be done as we say amakosen ikwelo lijalo Uh, thank you very much, Andama. Um, yeah, more more food for thought. Uh, even broader, bring a, a political economy uh, lens over it, and uh, yeah, kind of expanding the context of the discussion. And yeah, I think that's a good a good a good point at which we can open up the floor for questions. Um, yeah, Asanda, are you ready to maybe or Again, uh, you can ask questions to the respondents as well. And I think I will, I will kick off uh, with a question. And I think it was referred to uh, earlier, uh, but there was a question from uh, Ricardo Danes. I hope I'm pronouncing that wrong. Apologies if I'm not. Question slash comment and said, um, great presentation, Doc. I'm really proud of your accomplishment. It would be interesting to understand how the NYDA grants enhanced beneficiaries readiness and ability to access further commercial slash conventional loan finance for their growth or expansion. Maybe a good topic for another PhD. Um, <laughs> so I think, um, yeah, I think if perhaps uh, Asanda or, uh, or Mr. Karim would like to respond to that, I think uh, uh, Mr. Rasagam also kind of alluded to that and so did uh, Ongama to say, okay, what's the next, is there a next step in terms of, we've taken uh, youth entrepreneur only so far, but they need to expand their business beyond uh, the means or the scope of our, our, uh, uh, our mandate. Uh, Asanda, I'll, I'll let you begin. Hi, Sakina. Hi, go ahead. If you would um, mind. Just... Do you mind if you take more questions and then we can respond to maybe two or three at the same time? And I hope okay. more questions are directed to, to the respondents rather than me. <laughs> um, um, I have a question here from uh, Christensen. Um, you, can, you can ask a question via the chat or you can raise your hand. Um, I can give you the floor, Christensen. All right, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right, I don't know whether you can also see me or whether I should put on my uh, my video. I'm, I'm unsure. I think, thank you very much. I think it's it's great to listen to this. So I work for the International Labour Organization and I'm a, uh, I'm a specialist in sustainable enterprise. I've been dealing a lot with entrepreneurship and youth entrepreneurship over the years. And I, I had a few of the same comments um, that the that the in Dr. Ganesh he had or Mr. Ganesh about you know what I would have been great to see in a study like this at a PhD level I think would have been that a randomized control trial a control group to whether see whether these grant is working so I think you know it's great to see and I'm very positively and happy to learn that the um, oh I'm at a beat I see sorry about the background <laughs> um, uh, I'm very happy to see this this important impact uh, of these grants uh, how they've made. Uh, in these entrepreneurs' life, and I and I think we shouldn't like our our last speaker said. I don't think we should belittle, um, you know, the very important impact that this can have on giving certain people a step up in life. But I think if you're looking at broader systemic change in South Africa, and I know, know that very many many uh, different lived realities and people come from all walks of life, and I think it's a wonderful diverse country. But I think if you look at the high unemployment rate and you look at the high a youth unemployment rate, as we also heard, is more than 41%. My question would be, how can we 
create a better ecosystem where we don't need to, as Ganesh also said, retort to very limited fiscal space to give uh, young entrepreneurs access to finance. And, and, and here my question would be to, uh, to Dr. Fatoy, but also to the respondents as you're asking for, what is, how can you, how do you feel that I think education is a very important aspect here. How can the education system prepare young people much better for that transition from education to the labor market? And we know they go into labor markets where in South Africa, where formal employment opportunities are very scarce. So very often you find many of these entrepreneurs, they become necessity entrepreneurs. They have no other options, but at the same time, they don't have the skills or competencies to become entrepreneurs. And that's why, you know, we set up many young people for failure. So I don't believe that entrepreneurs or youth entrepreneurship necessarily is a panacea for the high levels of youth employment. I think it's one of the elements, one of the responses. So my question would be, Dr. Fatron, to the response, and how can the education system perhaps focus much more on entrepreneurship education and passing on entrepreneurial skills and competencies so that these young entrepreneurs, when they enter the labor market, they cannot access a formal job. They already have some skills. And then they can go to NIDA and see then other these business support organizations because they're already much better prepared. So how can we create a better ecosystem uh, would be my comment. But uh, thank you for giving me the floor, program director. You're very welcome. You're very welcome, Jens. Um, we'll take one. We'll take one more question from Siviwe, and then Ibanati. I I note your hand, and I'll ask you to raise your question in the next round. Uh, Siviwe, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, sir, and um, good morning. Um, twofold the question um, to the NYDA, but also to Dr. Fotoi. Eastern Cape, through an exec study that was uh, conducted recently. Um, was tagged a poor province where people are working. Um, I want to ask Dr. Futui, in her study, as she analyzed uh, the grant recipients, what was the proportion of young entrepreneurs that are taking the, let me call it the, the unusual streams like agribusiness, um, because Eastern Cape is endowed with uh, resources and, um, and land for not only terrestrial agriculture, but uh, modern, smart, urban and peri-urban agriculture. That could be one option for young, young people. But I just want to find out from her, the spread of the, of the recipients, the interest in agribusiness um, in Eastern Cape. Um, by the, the looking at uh, the recipients, like the number of recipients that are in the agribusiness compared to IT and other usual entrepreneurial spaces. And then the second question goes to uh, the NYDA and then maybe to the World Bank as well. One of the challenges of uh, advancing entrepreneurship is uh, at the early stages of entrepreneurship. No one wants to fund startups. And I would think that the grant program of the NYDA um, at a policy level seeks to close that gap, usher entrepreneurs into the market, and then they can access funding and support from the usual financial institutions, whether it's developmental funding institutions or the banks. Um, in, in the study, it, does it seem like we are achieving that goal of ushering them and then leaving them to the hands of the market? Are we achieving that goal or are we looking to get uh, startups fully into, the, uh, into entrepreneurship? or are we doing enough at policy level to just usher them and make sure that they are ready now to navigate um, in the market and get support from the, the ordinary financial institutions? Because at the early stages, it's, it's hard to get anyone to listen to a startup, let alone invest in a startup, just like Ongama said. So just those two questions for me. It can be NYDA that answers the second one or the World Bank. The first one is for Dr. Foto, a quick one. How does it look in terms of agribusiness and youth in the Eastern Cape? Thank you very much. 
thank you very much, Sir. We have um, some two very pertinent questions. Um, please allow me some uh, discretion as the program chair. Um, Mr. Karim has to leave uh, very soon. So if you will allow me, uh, Dr. Fotoy, I'll, I'll, I'll let him respond to uh, the, the questions and comments first, please. Please go ahead, uh, Mr. Karim. Yeah, thanks, thanks Akile. Uh, apologies, if it's Friday, this mosque gets, gets a little bit hectic. Um, but, but I thought the discussion is so robust that if I don't get a chance to respond, I may regret it forever. Um, so I think certainly there's a lot of questions and, and, and the third respondent raises a lot of issues around the political economy. Even we probably need a, a coffee to discuss the depth of those issues. Um, but I think, I think in terms of, of some of the questions that have been framed, right? The, the first one around, it's well and good to get a young person started and get them past that value of debt of two years. And, and what happens beyond that, right? I think, I think a big part of, government has put a lot of resources behind small businesses. Right? We've got the Small Enterprise Finance Agency and the Small Enterprise Development Agency. And, and I think very much so in my opinion, NYD plays a supportive role to those institutions. They, they take the main lead, particularly from a government perspective in terms of, you know, um, development of entrepreneurs in this country here. Yeah? Um, and then CIFA itself, I mean, CIFA disperses close to a billion rand every year in, in funding to enterprise. I, I do think in that space, access to finance is not so much the major issue, but, but access to markets where we have a very highly monopolized South African economy becomes a bit more of a challenge. And, and there you need government to intervene a, little, a bit more from an incentive, from a, from a trade perspective in being able to open up markets which are traditionally blocked to new entrants. And I think, I think for me, that's where more of the solution lies in the growth and the expansion phase of entrepreneurs. Um, on the agriculture related question, you know, I mean, we were, we were heavily surprised in the, when we did COVID relief. Um, well, one of the reliefs that were put together by the Department of Agriculture, Rural Development and Land Reform was um, support vouchers to small scale agricultural farmers. Yeah? And I mean, I think the program had 160,000 applications. And of that, 70% were young people. I mean, we've got the report I can, I can share it after the session here. But, but there really seems to be a large amount of potential for small scale agricultural farmers. Yeah? Through our National Youth Service Program, particularly in rural KwaZulu Natal, we're supporting um, um, small scale agricultural farmers with institutional support around vaccination of animals, around uh, proper feed and that kind of thing to prevent, for example, what we see statistics around high amounts of deaths and mortality amongst animals in small scale agriculture, for example. So, I mean, we're sitting here addressing one piece of the ecosystem today, which is access funding, and no doubt an important piece, but there are many pieces to the puzzle which need to be resolved, yeah. Um, I think in terms of funding startups, we're definitely trying to do a lot more in that space today. I think we are um, putting the focus more on startups. I think there's also an argument to be made is that, you know, how do you target the best kind of startups coming in, right? And, and I think a lot of what we see is coming out of universities in South Africa. A lot of the innovation that we are seeing of businesses that have the ability to scale and expand the strong startups come from universities. So how do you harness that innovation and, and, and put it together? Yeah? Um, the last point I wanted to make is in relation to, well, let me make two last points. One is, I think Ganesh touched on it, is important, is that this can never, this conundrum can never be solved by government. Right? You have to rope in the private sector in what is a very high risk space of capital, right? But I can assure you, that there is money to be made for the private sector in playing in the space around micro and small enterprise, right? I mean, if you think about the per people we hire sometimes to paint our houses or fix our garage doors or many of the artisan trades, right? Many of those people prior to being, they operate in a very cash-based, cash-focused space, right? Because they need a deposit so they can buy materials, they need a deposit so they can keep coming to work. But very rarely do those people fail to deliver, right? And 
What we need is different mechanisms to prove creditworthiness outside of the traditional mechanisms of financial statements and business bank accounts and that kind of thing. I hope I remember my second point that I wanted to make. The second point I wanted to make is what I think the president touched on in the State of the Nation. And it's a very tricky point. I noticed it didn't get a lot of media coverage. But the president did say that in order to respond better to the needs in a challenging physical environment, we need to look at where we might have too many duplicated functions within government. Right? And I do feel that there are many institutions who are, have duplicated mandates and doing the same thing. Right? And if we were to consolidate effort, I think we could put together a larger pool of resources focusing based on research-based output on what actually works for young people and works for people of this country. Yeah? I think we have to have that hard decision, right? To say, we have to consolidate the size of government to be able to put more money into citizens' hands and transform the economy. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Rosine. That was fantastic. Um, Dr. Fotoy, your response? Thanks, Akile. And thanks to Wasim for going first. Give me more time to think <laughs> about my answers. Um, so let me start with um, Siviwe, because his question is, is um, short and direct. So in terms of um, the study participants, only about 5% indicated that they are in the agricultural sector. And I mean, this is a general reflection of what's happening in the, in the economy, sorry, in the Eastern Cape province, um, as far as youth entrepreneurship is concerned. Um, however, if you look at the, the figures um, post 2019, you know, with the, uh, with the lockdown or COVID-19, there seemed to be an increase in young people um, getting into the agricultural sector. So, but as far as the study is concerned, we only got 5% of the participants who are in the agricultural sector. And then let me go to um, Ricardo's question about whether the grant funding enhanced the beneficiaries, rate, beneficiaries readiness and ability to access further commercial. I would believe so uh, because I mean they, they indicate, especially in the folk in the focus group, um, that it the, the grant funding helped them to grow. And obviously, as a as a business, if you grow, you are able to then, you know, um access, you know, other opportunities elsewhere. However, there is still a gap. And you also pick this up because, you know, the participants, you know, kept on stressing that NYDA needs to, you know, provide um, access to finance for businesses who are in the growth and um, expansion um, stages, which gives us an indication that, you know, there's, there's still some struggles there. And then the question by... Jens, I hope I pronounce your name correctly, I'm from the World Bank. So firstly, you made a comment um, about the, the approach that was taken in terms of establishing causality um, in, the impact, um, uh, in the economic impact study. So the different approaches um, to establishing causality, so the one that I've taken is a non-experimental approach and the one that you are recommending um, in terms of ran randomized um, controlled trials that's an approach that fits studies that you know want to um, do experimental, um, you know, uh, or, or to um, get experimental um, results um, in terms of causality. Something that I also mentioned in the last slide, and it also would be much more fitting if you want to do a longitudinal study. Um, so in this case um, of my study, that was you know. That was the approach that was that was taken. I'm also happy to, because I understand in the presentation, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time explaining the methodology that I've taken or um, that I've chosen. So once you get to read the thesis, I mean, you read my my chapter two, um, which is the theoretical foundation, and also um, the talks a lot about the, the the approach that I've taken, then you'll be able to maybe better understand um, what I did there. And then your question on education, you know, 
it's a uh, it's one of the recommendations i think it's my third recommendation um that when you read the thesis you also you know um get to see that you know i make reference to how our, our education um institutions which is um your high schools your your primary schools as well as um us in the tertiary space we need to do a lot more um firstly we need to get a um, entrepreneurship education or, or curriculum that cuts across all um, fields. So it doesn't matter, matter whether you're in engineering or in economics, um, be exposed to that entrepreneurship um, education. And, you know, I also argue, um, you know, Prof. Nwati has cautioned me a lot about this because in economics, we don't use the word free, but I think that, you know, entrepreneurship education should be free, even if you know there's somebody paying for it, um, you know, somewhere at the back. But the people who are receiving it, the students, you know, should get it for free. For example, our students struggle with their fees for the courses that you know they've applied for. So now, if we are saying that they must also get entrepreneurship education because we believe that it's going to help them, um, you know, post uh, tertiary education, then we should make it easier for them to get it. We should make it free. Let's not you know, in, you know, um, sort of increase the burden, um, financial burden, uh, you know, for them to get the, 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 the entrepreneurship education, which is so much needed. And also, I mean, we need, as South Africa, we need to really just get into this culture of entrepreneurship. And I think if, if, if it starts at home, it will also, you know, filter into our education, and also filter just in, you know, in, in our everyday um, lives. So I don't know which other question. Yeah, I think I've responded to the three questions that um, were put to me. If I missed anything, then um, maybe someone else will pick it up or you can just highlight it for me again. Um, yes, thank you, Asanda. I think you, you, you did respond to all the questions. Um, I would like to give uh, Dr. Mtimka a chance to respond because he has to travel as well. Um, and then, yeah, and then we'll take another round of questions. Please go ahead, Ongama. Um, good afternoon. Seems like I can't enable my video. Um, uh, so thanks a lot for, 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 for being here. Um, um it's been it's been great to be in this platform i think that a number of uh, uh, forward moving comments have been made both in terms of what asanda needs to do in his study as well as you know broadly in terms of how other people could tackle the questions one thing i i i am I'm, i feel very strongly about is that we should we should shy away from at this stage rationalizing the institutions that are involved in development finance because the culture the the, the culture that uh, you know south african dfis operate with is so not developing country culture and unless may wasim we've fought those battles of in in exactly what ways to transform ways to measure potential to succeed and 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 risk we shouldn't uh, con consolidate the entities um yeah because because i mean that the, we, uh, there's a lot of push towards that the state doesn't lack money in south africa it yes indeed there will always be a lack of money but by by looking at the wide range of institutions that are involved in development support we don't lack money in fact when COVID funds came, I knew right when they were announced that they were going back, going to go back to the coffers of the state, precisely because of the exclusionary ways in which uh, funding works in South Africa. So, uh, and and also we we must be humble enough to accept uh, not knowing about the systemic. Uh, to my colleague from the from the uh, uh, from the ILO as well as uh, Ganesh. We must be humble enough to, to accept that sometimes doing what we know at a micro level is going to take care of the systemic. The same way, uh, and we as we learn lessons from 
that those to that level, we leverage them for the systemic. The same way that we were taught for many centuries that uh, we, we, things could trickle down from the systemic to the to the micro. Uh, thanks, thanks, colleagues. Sorry, I have to go catch a flight uh, three hours from where I am. Thank you very much, Dr. Ntinka, and thank you for your time. Um, it's okay. I think what I'll do is I'll I'll give uh, another open up for another round of questions and then. Uh, depending on how many questions we get, we can also allow a uh, further response to the questions and comments that have already been raised. Um, Yvanati, I think you were the next in line. Uh, please go ahead and ask your question. All right. Um, thank you very much, Akil. Uh, I see that uh, Mr. Karim and Dr. Mtik are not here because my, my questions were actually directed to them. But anyway, I'll, I'll just want, I will ask anyways. So I think my question was specifically related to the criteria of, of NYTA grant, because I know that at NYTA, one of the criteria is that one should not be employed and one should not be a student. And I just wanted to ask, doesn't that really discourage um, young people to see entrepreneurship as, as, as a, a career path? Just like uh, Dr. Fatoy mentioned on, on, on her recommendations, that we really need to encourage young people to, to see uh, entrepreneurship as a, as, a, as a career path. Why do we wait for young people to, to first be unemployed or to graduate and be unemployed before we can fund them and, 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 and motivate them to, to start businesses? So in the absence of, of, of um, I think, Mr. Karim, maybe I can just ask uh, Dr. Fatoy to, to maybe to comment on that. Uh, what does she think about that criteria of not allowing employed young people to allow to apply for grant or not allowing students to, to apply for grants? Thank you. Um, actually, we have quite a number of, we have quite a number of participants joining in from the NYDA, people are involved directly mm -hmm. with the grant program. So Guatemala if, and if um, Miss, if Wasim is, has already left, I think if we can, I'm not gonna call out names, but if there's anyone um, involved with the NYDA grant program who would like to respond directly to that question. Any words? then that will be, you know, very helpful. Uh, thanks, Asanda. I think before we get to that, I think there's a couple of unwelcome interruptions. Uh, I think, uh, Tian, if you could uh, kick some of the people that are unmuting with some bad language and would like to apologize to, to anyone tuning in. Um, before we open up Asanda as well, um, I see uh, Ganesh has to leave quite soon. So if you don't mind, um, let me just uh, open up the floor to any questions that may specifically be to uh, Mr. Rasagam, and then we'll allow him to respond to uh, any of the previous questions and then I'll open up again. So uh, colleagues, if there are any specific questions for uh, Mr. Rasagam, please go ahead and ask. There's a, there's a, there doesn't seem to be any, but uh, Ganesh, uh, maybe you want to just uh, respond to any of the comments before you leave? Yeah, no, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Sakili. And, and um, uh, maybe just, just to share uh, um, a bit of evidence from the work that we are doing with uh, the Department of Small Business Development and Department of Science Innovation. I mentioned the Innovation Bridge Portal project. Um, we have we have uh, uh, been working with uh, various cohorts of South African entrepreneurs, uh, and that's a lot of learnings that are coming from this interaction to its entrepreneurs. Um, and some of them are actually quite uh, counterintuitive, if I may say so. So, for one thing, is that um, the, the entrepreneurs that we are targeting are the what we call underserved entrepreneurs, 
those who come from townships and rural areas and, and who are struggling with, uh, you know, very early stage uh, businesses. Some of them at ideation stage, some of, some of them have a product, but they don't have a market and so on. But what we find that is most useful for these entrepreneurs is the coaching and mentoring support that we provide through this program. So each of them has four hours of, 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 of access to coaching and mentoring, provided they complete uh, a learning, uh, a, a hybrid learning program, uh, which consists of different modules. So there's a self-assessment process where they go through a, a self-paced um, learning module, which looks at their business model and they identify the gaps in, in their knowledge and their business. And then this, there's a, a program uh, of, of learning, again, self-based learning, uh, where they can address these gaps and then they put through this coaching and mentoring program. So often, you know, when you talk about access to funding, they don't even uh, understand why they need the funding, for what purposes and so on. So there are some of these core challenges in entrepreneurs face, and that's what we're trying to, to uh, address through this Innovation Bridge Portal program. Uh, and and um, you know, I'm happy to share details of that. Uh, uh, Asanda, if you're interested, we can have another conversation. But um, what I wanted to share is that, uh, that uh, you know, there, there's a responsibility from government towards grant funding. And, and we need to make sure that the grant funding uh, uh, addresses the uh, objectives that it was meant for. And so, so data is important, data platforms are important. And, and evaluation and monitoring and uh, and reporting back uh, uh, is also important. And these are areas that I think we are working with the government agencies now in South Africa and in the other countries in the region. So thank you. I just wanted to share that with uh, with all of you. And sorry, I have to drop off shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Sagam. And yeah, thank you for being here. And if there are any links or uh, that you want to share? Maybe you, if you have a quick moment, you can drop them in the chat before we before you head off. Um, other than that, I would like to open up uh, the webinar again to any additional questions or comments. Uh, Tian, I'm not sure if I've missed anything in the chat. Nothing. There's one thing in the chat now. Okay. Um. Let me. I'm hoping that somebody will give. Okay. Let me try and answer Ibanati's um question. Oh, yes. And you know, I, I've I've had this discussion about the um criteria, um with Prof Mwati. It was, you know, when I started looking into the, 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 the program, I also, you know, asked myself, why are we excluding, or why does the program um, exclude people who are working from applying for, for the grant? Um, it's the first time that I'm hearing that they exclude students. I don't know if it's a new thing, but you know, I, I, I've never come across it. I, I know quite a lot of students who you know have benefited from the from the grant. So I don't know if it's something new or maybe Yibanati misunderstood that. But what I know for sure is that if you are working, if you're a working individual, then um, you cannot apply for the grant. So my initial thoughts were, were, you know, a lot of studies have, have shown that um, and people who are working and having businesses, their big businesses, you know, over time become more successful. They're able to stick it out because they have, you know, um, an, a guaranteed income from their work of employ employment, and also they're able to, you know, use some of their of their salaries or wages, you know, to support the business cash flow or whatever needs um, the business may have. And so 
but when I had this discussion with Prof. Mwati, we, we then had to go back to understanding why we have, um, or why the NYDA as an agency was established, who is it targeting, um, and also what's their sort of developmental agenda. So from those, you know, um, discussions that we had, um, we sort of, or I sort of got to the conclusion that, you know, it wouldn't make sense to support somebody who is, who has a job um, over somebody who doesn't have, you know, somebody who's unemployed. And also, you know, another way to look at it, maybe, um, okay, let me, let me leave it there. Or, or, or let me say it. Or maybe you know, there's thinking. Other people would think that uh, people who have a, who are who have full time jobs would not necessar necessarily uh, pay more attention to the to the business. It would be just a side thing, and then um, you know, for this type of assistance, given you know the reasons behind the establishment of the agency itself. It wouldn't, you know, um, necessarily make sense to um, uh, fund employed people. Um, I don't want to say too much on this. Um, like I said, you know, these are some of the conclusions that I, you know, have, you know, come to uh, based on um, our own discussions. Um, but it is an important question that Uibanati um, has raised. And you know, I also had that question. Um, if that's why I was saying, if we can get a definite, definite answer as to why, hearing it from the agency itself, why they have that criteria or exclusion, um, maybe we are wrong, and maybe then you know they can correct us. Thank you, Asanda. Um, Siabulela, your hand is also noted. Can I just check if there's anyone? Um, from the NYDA who's available to clarify. Um, yes, Mr. Zondani's hand is up. Ah, okay. So, uh, Mr. Zondani, I'll give you the floor. Thanks. Thanks very much, Akil. Am I audible? Yes, you are, sir. Thanks a lot. Um, so, just quickly, as it relates to the unemployment status and um, exclusion, in fact, the whole understanding is that we'd want the young people, the young person who's entering into entrepreneurship to be fully involved in the operations of the business. So that's the logic behind that. And it really is, it ends there, right? As it relates to students, students are supported. Students are not excluded as per my understanding. Um, <clears throat> so on that, on that, on that, on that score, I think, I think the, 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 the participants can 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 be rest assured that students are supported. They are not taken out of um, their studies or whatever the case. So long as they can prove that they can indeed um, operate the business um, 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 satisfactorily, even if they've got a business partner who may not necessarily be a student or be tied up in in full time in poor employment and who will be operating the business themselves, right? So so as a a principle uh, of policy, we, we don't necessarily ask that students um, pull back or drop out of school. And to your point, um, Dr. Fotoy, there is definitely a positive correlation between formal employment, be it current or former, and success in entrepreneurship. We've also found this as the NYDA in our own sort of desktop research and just trends that you've seen, whereas I'll make an example, um, we had a case out in Port Elizabeth where a young person was working for Standard Bank, uh, one of the banks, or we may call it that, um, and they started their own business, um, very interesting business. I won't mention the name, but they succeeded quite well. They did extremely well. They've set themselves up. They've gotten a, a, a spot where they can operate. And that was back in 2018, right? And they're still operating as, and are doing relatively well. So we've seen this quite often as a trend that there definitely is a positive correlation between formal employment, current or former, 
and success in entrepreneurship. So the answer to that question, um, students are supported, um, formal employment becomes a challenge because there's a, a concern um, as it relates to the full participation or in, 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 the, actually in the actual operations of the business. So that's the long and short of it. Thanks. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Zandani. That was a, that was, thank you for clarifying that matter. And just to uh, affirm the findings of your studies or your desktop research is um, a comment from Jens Christensen who says, um, when it comes to successful entrepreneurship, global studies show that many, many people ha have a proper job before they become entrepreneurs. Therefore, it's a good idea to, al to also allow employed people access to a grant to start a business. Um, yeah. And then, so I think uh, that's something that perhaps uh, NYDA can look at. Um, an additional comment is many youth lack basic work skills and life skills, and then we try to turn them into entrepreneurs. Is this feasible? I don't know who cares to respond to that, or perhaps I can, before we go to the response, are there any questions that, or comments that anyone would like to ask? Okay, so uh, um, perhaps uh, the remaining speakers can then uh, respond to Jens and do you agree that uh, many youth lack basic work experience and life skills and then we try to turn them into entrepreneurs? So I think this is related to the comment about, you know, uh, entrepreneurs, are, entrepreneurs are more likely to be successful have, if they've had previous work experience. Um, sorry, Sakila, can you rephrase the question? Or? So um, I'll do that in a second, but I see another hand. So okay. I see your hand. Um, the question or the comment from Jens was many youth lack many youth lack basic work experience and life skills, and then we try to turn them into entrepreneurs. Is this feasible? Is the question. So if we please go and ask, go ahead and ask your question. Um, thank you, Sakile, and congratulations, Dr. For Toy, uh, I'd like to attempt um, to answer the, the the question in or the comment in the chat box about young people turning young people into entrepreneurs. Can I do that? I don't have a question. Uh, yes, please go ahead. Okay, first a small introduction for myself. I manage a is a an institution that uh, supports small businesses. And we work mostly with youth. So that's why I feel I can sort of share, you know, some insight on that comment. Yes, it is true that what we found from, from, from working with uh, entrepreneurs is that the ones who thrive the most are the ones who had previous uh, employment before. And the ones who come straight from school uh, we tend to have a challenge in that, on the one hand, they seek entrepreneurship in the absence of employment. So they go uh, towards um, uh, 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 developing businesses because they seek something to make up for lack of employment. And um, they, they, they tend to lack discipline and their work ethic differs from the people who have been employed before. Must remember, if, you have, if you've been in an employment um, a relationship, the certain principles must adhere to the certain discipline, there's a certain way in which you carry yourself. And I find it very challenging with young people who have never been employed to get them to be disciplined and, and to behave in, in a manner that is expected of an entrepreneur. It is not, um, no, it is not, not feasible. It is a challenge and, and, and it, it just takes the whole, it just makes the whole entrepreneurial journey seem to be more challenging and, and, and longer when you're dealing with someone who's never been employed before. There is a handful of those who just come in, they are entrepreneurial in themselves. And those ones, they, they do try, but it, it, that is a very small amount. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Sibuya. That was uh, a good response from our practitioners. Uh, just a word of warning. Uh, we have uh, some feedback from Jens who was saying that uh, the person that tried to hack and interrupt the webinar, I think the handle was can06, sent, uh, sent him an email uh, to open. So if anybody else gets that email, uh, please, please do not open it and please report it as, as spam or junk. Um, colleagues, I think we are almost out of time. Um, I'll give chance for one more question or comment if there is one, and then I'll call on Prof. Mishi to do the uh, closing remark and vote of thanks. Is there any other questions or comments? No. All right. Um, then without further ado, guys, um, Prof. Mishi, if you don't mind, uh, Please, can you do the uh, closing remarks and the vote of thanks for us? All right, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Piri. And really, you know, uh, we're driving the vehicle with, you know, great uh, enthusiasm and also giving everyone the opportunity to, to speak. Greetings to everyone. Yes, my name is Siren Mishi, HOD, Department of Economics at Nelson Mandela University. Very much honored to speak to you. And um, you know, before any further ado, I really want to congratulate Dr. Sandra Fotoy, one, on her doctoral journey, and two, for having the confidence to call upon people to say, come listen to what I have found. This is the kind of um, approach that we, we like, and this is what we encourage to say. The research when done, if it gets stuck in the libraries, then it's not going to have any effect. And the knowledge economy that we so aspire and that is in the National Development Plan would not uh, materialize. So we seek to see that the studies that we do as a university, they go out there. And those um, practitioners, you know, policymakers, and the general you know, society would then benefit from, from the recommendations that are made. I think there was a great list of recommendations that have been made. And we all do agree, and as I heard from the respondents and from the comments, how you know relevant those recommendations are and how practical they are. So congratulations, Dr. Sander Fotoy. We very much are proud of, of you. Then to the discussions, you took time to, to be here. It's always busy at your beginning of the year in any organizations, but um, we really appreciate firstly, Ms. Karim from National Youth Development Agents. And this is the organization that has been also studied. Thank you so much for, for coming and all the team that you brought also to, to join. Uh, thank you so much, NYDA. First, also for the opportunity to, for us to study the organization and also being able to come here and provide uh, feedback. Quite great insight that came also from, uh, from the discussion and also responding to questions uh, from respondents. Thank you so much. Uh, Ms. Karim and the, the team, entire team from NYTA. From the World Bank, Mr. Rasagam, thank you so much again for, for attending, taking time also to, uh, to, to go through the, the, this presentation and also to prepare for the, uh, for the discussion. We really got also great insights, great notes are emerging there that need to be followed through for research. I, Noted you highlight in some of the areas that Dr. Fotoy, and I think that also extends to any other um, researchers that they would follow through those things that needs to, to be investigated. And I can see that, you know, as practitioners, as policymakers, there's that appetite for this kind of research. And thank you so much. And any colleagues that have also joined from the World Bank, we really um, appreciate your support and your audience is greatly appreciated. Also to you know to Dr. Ongamam Timka, a fellow colleague, and really um, you know someone who also took time to to speak to us to respond to this particular presentation. Thank you so much for the great insight and for challenging you know many, outlining even the the journey your, your journey and how it also links to the discussion that was um, that was at hand here. Thank you so much for finding that time. And we continue as well to, to see how these different disciplines continue to connect 
and for a solid uh, you know, recommendation to society. So all these inputs, they come from different disciplines. They all converge so that when we talk about youth matters, when we talk about entrepreneurship, you know, we then really have you know, sound recommendation. So we really appreciate that, um, uh, Dr. Ntinka. And also I want to acknowledge and to say thank you to our director of the school, Professor Ronin Mwadi, who did the welcoming, and also he is the study promoter. Thank you so much and congratulations, Professor Nwadi. And we continue to look forward to your leadership, continue to, to inspire. Like I said at the beginning, uh, Mr. Piri, you are a great driver. Thank you so much for finding time in your schedule. I understand that it is busy time of the year at the university, but to find time to facilitate this engagement with different stakeholders, with different um, you know, uh, attendees, you know, it is quite remarkable how we have managed to handle and to deliver a smooth uh, program. Thank you so much, Mr. Piri, for, for that we, we really appreciate. Then the men behind the scene, some of you might not have seen uh, his face, but you might have seen his name. You might have heard his name being called to say, attend to those maybe other uh, you know, non-identifiable participants that might be coming into the show. Uh, Mr. Tian Heber, thank you so much. We always uh, you know, bank on you and rely on you for the technology. He's an e-technologist that we have rely upon within the university, within the uh, uh, business and economic sciences faculty. Thank you so much, Ms. Heber, continue to, to support us in, in that way. And to all the attendees, thank you so much for the audience and for all the questions, comments. Let's continue to engage with Dr. Fotoyi. Let's continue to engage with many um, uh, people that, uh, that are here on the platform where you have had discussions highlighting issues of importance, issues that re really also require further research. And let's engage Dr. Fotoyi on that work. And I think many have been asking, where can we get more? That means there's that appetite to, to want to know more about, about this, um, this work. So please be on the lookout, even on our webpage, that you can be able to see the recordings uh, or the, the presentation so that uh, you can get to know more uh, in detail if you have missed any part of this, this uh, presentation. And I believe that um, you know, Dr. Fotoy is also very much available to respond to any other questions that you might come up with during your practice as you do your everyday work, you might actually encounter some areas that need the further research. And I think in one of her recommendations, she made it also very clear how um, other institutions like NYDA, that means any other institution that might be also in the room, can open opportunities for research, enable uh, researchers to come in to do the research, and then they can be able to to share and definitely, as she had highlighted, that needs to be done within the confines of Poppy Act. So thank you also to Nelson Mandela University for giving us the platform that we can uh, be able to, to have uh, this event. And I really thank everyone and wish everyone a great Friday and let's continue to, to engage and um, get ideas shared across for the better of our society. Thank you so much to everyone and um, enjoy your day. Thank you very much, Prof. Um, and again, a special congratulations to Dr. Fatoy and a very special thanks to Mr. Tian Heber, our e-technologist. Thank you to all the participants and attendants, um, and we hope to see you at the next webinar very soon. Thank you. Thank you.